Good morning. Hello, oh, there's a car coming, hang on. Hey, there it goes. It's Tuesday today, bin day. I'm starting a bit later than normal because uh, one of my members of staff has got a hospital appointment. So, we're coming in late. So how are you? All right? Trust everything is well? I finally think I've got a solution to the workflow for these videos. We, uh, this is recorded on the mobile phone. The sound comes off the mobile phone. The pictures, the driving pictures come off the CCTV in the car, uh, which is recorded on a little chip, microchip. So finally, what I'm doing now is if I record one of these, I'm offloading the video from the camera and the chip when I get to work. I just take the camera and the chip into work, then sometime during the day I offload the raw footage. And then when I remember, I've got a 60 gigabyte uh, USB stick, and so I then load the uh, raw footage on the stick for however many days. It takes about seven, seven days, 10 days or something. And then I take it home and edit it on the uh, computer at home, and then uh, and render it, and then put it back on the now empty USB stick, and take it back to work where I upload it on the fast Wi-Fi. So I know it sounds complicated, but it's necessary because I've got the fast computer at home, and I've got the big storage and the fast Wi-Fi, you know, fast internet at work. So what are you going to do? And the alternative is to spend more time at work of an evening uh, editing the uh, editing editing at work. But that means I'm then going to have to buy an unnecessarily expensive video editing computer for work. And uh, you know I don't really want to spend any more time at work. You know I'd rather have it all sitting on my computer at home, waiting for when I've, I'm in the mood to edit a few videos. Bearing in mind that uh, these videos I mean they're about 20 minutes long aren't they and they they don't take less than 20 minutes to edit although I do fast forward all the uh, I fast forward the video so I play it at 150% uh, speed <coughs> excuse me which is good because then you can still get an idea of what the content is so you can do like uh, titling and labeling you know while while sort of correctly summarising the content, so you do have to watch it through <clears throat> once before you upload it to YouTube. Um, you know, just because say, I mean, there's some stupid things like that. You know, I might have a sneezing fit or a coughing fit halfway through and think at the time, oh, I'll cut that out, and then two weeks later, of course, you can't remember which video that was in or what part of the video it was in. So you have to listen. And I recommend that anyway because. Uh, I think uh, reviewing, let me just put my winger in. Reviewing what you, uh, your output is, is a sort of chicken thing. Reminds me of when I used to have chickens. Um, you should always check your output. Always, 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 you know. And uh, it's a good, uh, here's a good tip. If you were writing something, and I used to write leaders for the uh, dental practice magazine. They'd be about a thousand words long, 800, 900 words long. And uh, they used to take half a day minimum, you know, and sometimes slightly more than that. And I didn't have the luxury like Kevin Lewis of, uh, of being on the uh, MDU payroll and therefore getting paid pretty pretty handsomely to, to write. Um, you know, I was just a dentist and so half a day writing editorial was half a day not doing dentistry but um, anyway but my, my point was that uh, you stare at these things on the screen and, and this came as a bit of a revelation to me as well when I looked at people who were doing paintings and drawing charcoal drawing and pastel colours and stuff like that and uh, you, you look at these uh, on YouTube you can see these things
and uh, I was I don't know I just thought I just thought that if you're an artist and you're artistic and you could draw things then you, and you saw a cow and you wanted to draw a cow that you just went do, 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 and drew a cow you know <laughs> uh, I didn't realize how much revision goes into things like drawings I didn't realize that you might like sketch the cow and then sketch it again and then and then draw over your sketch and then rub that out and then and then change the head of the cow and then change change the cow because it looks more like a horse change it into a horse or whatever you know I didn't realize the artist did all that you just look at the final thing and you and you think oh they've like almost made it appear by magic um, and uh, someone who reads an article might think oh you know that good that guy's a good writer you know he's he's put some funny jokes in there and he summed it up you know really really well the situation and uh, they don't realize that uh, my first version that I write is not at all it doesn't bear any resemblance to the finished the finished version yeah, I have literally if you read the fin my finished version of anything I have literally rubbed out everything I wrote down at first and replaced it with something else you know it's a bit like doing a barn conversion by by keeping the roof and knocking down the walls and then uh, knocking down the roof so if you're um, if you're writing anything then you have to read it you know as if uh, you're a consumer as if you're going to be the sort of person who's opening up the magazine and, and reading the leader and, and try and uh, sort of get a sense of how it comes across, you know. And other people are um, very good at giving you feedback if you can work with them, you know, if they can be honest. I think that's why if you're a writer, you need like a literary agent or someone who can read your stuff and say, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's stronger at the beginning or, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to miss that punchline or something. Um, and it, but if you're an amateur writer, then really only you've only got your wife or your husband, or <laughs> you know, or your nurse or someone. And uh, the trouble with them is, although they're lovely and they will read your stuff, they do uh, quite frequently feel that their job is to be just supportive, and therefore they will say, "Yeah, yeah, it's great, it's great." You know, <laughs> I love it, I love it. <laughs> and that's really, you know, with with all due respect to everybody who does that. Uh, <clears throat> That is not what you want. That is that is useless, right? That is that is totally useless. Uh, and I know, you know, if I was a singer or played in a band or something, I'd want, I'd want. When, and I know I've got a friend who's in the band, and and he gave me uh, uh, his music, you know, which is which is nice. I mean, I appreciate that he wants to share his albums with me and stuff like that, and. Uh, Although it's technically it's not exactly my type of music, but I'm happy to listen to it and give him some feedback. I mean, and and the sort of feedback, all, all the feedback that he was after was me saying like, yeah, I think that you know the best track on the album is is track four, you know. And he was like, oh yeah, really, really, you really think so? Yeah, you know, we like that one as well and because that's genuine feedback, you know. But just saying, uh, yeah, I listened to your album. Yeah, it was great. It's not. Uh, it's no use in, in any sort of utilitarian, practical way to an artist. And uh, although artists, are, you know, <laughs> business and art are sort of thought of as separate things, there is a business of producing art. You know, there is a there is a production line behind something like a leader. Uh, insofar as that, there's a methodology and a practicality about doing it. You have to find the time. You have to find a pencil. You have to lick it. You know. What I always found with uh, writing was that uh, you cannot assess on a computer screen what you've written on a computer screen. You, uh, I don't know what it is, but there's just uh, there are different ways of consuming stuff. And so, like for example, spoken or the written word, for example, you can consume it either as um, on a computer screen, you can read it on a computer screen, or you can print it out and read it on paper which is what I used to do for the uh, beta testing, sort of first draft. Or you can, uh, you know, you can have an audio book or whatever.
what I used to do was I used to uh, draft it on the computer screen because obviously that's much easier and then uh, leave it on the computer screen but print it off on paper and then uh, go somewhere completely different typically another room or into the kitchen stick it on the kitchen table or something and sit down with a red pen and just read it as, as though because that's the way it's going to be consumed is on paper and read it as a uh, sort of a written article and then and then what will happen is not only will you find the stupid little things like uh, spaces before commas and stuff like that but you'll also uh, realize that the, the, the flow of it is not can be improved you know certain words can be deleted certain words need to be changed and so by the time I'd finished that stage of it it was completely covered in red marks then what you do is you then take it back to the computer and while you can still remember all these little stupid fiddly things you change it all on the computer uh, which at which point doesn't look any different on the computer but obviously it is completely different and then uh, save it and then print it out again on paper and then take it through to the table and then read it again read it through again you know and uh, you may even find another couple of things you want to change at that point but only when you're completely happy that um, it reads okay should you then uh, should you then uh, uh, send it off you know or, or give it to someone else and say look can you read this for me and just make sure it's you know it's intelligible you know by the average sort of reader who's going to read it who might be interested to read it anyway So that's, uh, we had a nice day yesterday, took the staff out for lunch. And uh, it's something, I'm not saying it's something we don't do, but it's not something we do do either. It's, uh, when I take the staff out for lunch, it tends to be a spur of the moment thing. I don't, and we don't always go to the same place. We just decide, we, you know, should we go down West Bay Cafe or... Stuart's calf or something or uh, just go and buy some fish and chips sit on the seafront or whatever um, and I tend to do it if we've got like an hour and a half because I think an hour and a half is about enough time to get down somewhere or to sit down and, and, and sort of eat in a reasonably leisurely fashion uh, so if we we look like we're going to finish by about half twelve and we're due back at two then we, uh, we all bundle in the car and go off somewhere and there's a bit of a um, adventure to it you know there's a bit of excitement it's a bit like a school trip there's a bit of a school trip about it uh, so and I, I recommend that you know do something a bit spontaneous you know a bit uh, a bit random um, the staff love that and I mean let's face it I mean if you're in a job where you're just getting paid hourly and uh, you know you're sitting in front of a computer screen taking phone calls from patients who want to know how much the dentist is going to charge to make an indenture or whatever um, you know if, if someone says like come on don't lock the computer let's uh, let's go and have an ice cream or something um, in general they the staff tend to quite appreciate that you know it adds to their quality of their employment um, I mean obviously you're paying for everything you know but then that's not it's not a massive amount of money I mean you're talking less than 20 quid and the amount the, 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 the morale the gain in morale is, is, is more than commensurate with the 20 quid you're going to spend and the, and the little bit of petrol you know it really uh, bonds people together as a team and they get a chance to have a chat over the table instead of sort of chatting uh, across the desk in the reception or chatting across the kettle in the in your tiny little staff room they get a chance to chat across the table and uh, also and chat I think he's a good uh, again it's, it's not I wouldn't say I exactly encourage it but then I certainly don't discourage it you know I mean there was a time when then there was just me and Lou and when we used to have a chat at lunchtime but, but a man is a poor substitute for a woman <laughs> when it comes to chatting and now I've got a 
nurse and a receptionist, uh, and I'm sitting in the office writing the notes up and stuff like that, and and you you could hear them talking. Oh my God, you know what it's like. I mean, what are they? They talk about nothing. You know, I mean, the last time I bothered to listen to what they were talking about, they were comparing favourite chocolate bars. I mean, that's great, but then it makes them happy. No, it makes them happy, that's fine. So I don't mind that at all. As long as they know that, you know, if they need to... <coughs> if they need to concentrate on their job, then they, then they know that, you know. If, the, if the, there comes a point where uh, some application is required, uh, and also, you, you know, you, as I say, because you build up this teamwork and everything, um, you do quite frequently find that, um, you know, you look at your watch and uh, the staff's supposed to have gone home at, at five and it's quarter past five or half past five and they're all still here, um, sort of finishing up their work. And, <clears throat> and I've made it clear that uh, we, we had one receptionist who took... Um, <clears throat> abused the overtime to a shocking extent and uh, and we ended up getting rid of her for, for that reason among others or oh, taking it off you know because she would uh, deliberately uh, wait until one minute past five and so that she could claim another half an hour and so at that point I just abolished overtime and I said no I'm not, I don't accept that you can't get your work finished by five. And I don't tell you how, how much you complain and shout and scream that you can't. <clears throat> uh, you're just going to have to, and anything that you don't get finished, you'll have to do the next day. So, and of course, that, you know. <coughs> when we abolished overtime, we, we've never, it didn't really affect us, but... You know, I mean, it was, it was a workable system. Not having I mean, no overtime is a workable system. The, the sort of the uh, halfway house with overtime is to insist that your staff work late when you tell them, and then but tell them but promise them that they're going to get uh, their reward in heaven. You know, they're going to get time off in lieu, which is basically uh, you having to pay them when you don't need them. So. But I don't think staff like that, you know. I don't think... They may accept that there is a requirement to work late uh, on occasion, but to, in my mind, if you're a dentist and you're, you've adopted that, you know, uh, when I need you to work late, you must work late, I'll give you time off in lieu, I just think that's a recipe for dissatisfaction because you're imposing your requirements on the staff outside of the working hours, you know, outside of the contractual hours. And they might want to get home. They might be tired. They might need to do the tea. They might want to talk to their kids. There's all sorts of reasons why they might not want to stay. But having a clause in their employment contract, they insist that they have to stay and take time off at a time when, when perhaps they don't have to prepare dinner or they ha their children aren't at home, they're at school. Or, um, you know, I don't think it's, it's fair on them. It's better to have a, a highly motivated team that will work with you because they see the need, you know, they see. So, so for example, if you get, let's say, we got we have two emergency sessions uh, booked off every day. We have half an hour in the morning, half an hour, about four o'clock to do the uh, sterilization and everything. And um, if the morning session is booked up with an, with an emergency, and then you get another genuine emergency, um, the staff then know that um, their, their, their clean-up time afterwards is going to be compromised because you've got a, a second genuine emergency coming in. Um, what they, they share that uh, risk, if you like, with you because they're committed to doing the job that you're committed to doing. You know, they are they're part of the team with you that deals with um, you know the A team that deals with emergencies. And to a certain extent, it applies. Let's for, say, for example. <coughs> Excuse me again. Supposing you've got a chap who's, um, you know, we've got a chap coming in today. He goes to France a lot. I think he lives in France. Although he's got a business in the UK, which probably pays for him to live in France. And he comes over sort of every three months for a week or two just to see how his business is getting on. And um, 
uh, he needs a crown. He's very happy to pay for a crown and everything, but um, he's just rung up and said, look, I'm going to come come to the UK on such and such a day. Uh, any chance of getting my crown done? Now, the only way we can do that is to um, fit him in the lunch hour. Now, again, you know, I mean, what, what, how you respond as a surgery to that sort of challenge is certainly, I think, if you're an NHS surgery, you'd say, uh, forget it. Uh, you know, uh, I don't care what, what you do, but just don't come here. Um, if you're a surgery that uh, uh, it sticks very tightly to your hours and everything, um, perhaps because morale is very low or the staff are very low paid, and then the chances of you being able to organise that are quite low. If you're uh, a time off in loo practice, then you're going to, you might be able to do it, but your your staff are going to be, you know, you're really going to seriously piss off your staff. Whereas with us, we're like, shall we, what do you think? You know, we all sit around and say, what do you think? What shall we book him in the lunchtime? And I'm always the one who suggests it, but, uh, and then, and they always agree. And you might think, well, of course, you know, there's a power imbalance there, but do you know, uh, if any one of them said, uh, then then we won't have a lunch hour, or, or but no, that would, I don't think I could do that. Then, then it would be a no. You know, they they have got the right to veto that sort of thing, or at least suggest that we come up with another idea, like you know, for example, that we we cancel someone, or shorten somebody else's appointment, or do it on a different day, or or. Um, or even come in on a, uh, for a morning on a day that we wouldn't normally come in on. That you can do all sorts, of, you, and that's how flexible we are. So, oh yes, bang, nine twenty on the dot. Strolling to work. Quick crown prep, cup of tea, two checkups, and lunch. This is the life of a private dentist. Ooh. Right, well, I'm not going to bore you with anything else, so. <clears throat> and that's only because I can't think of anything that I could bore you with in the 10 seconds I've got left. So, <clears throat> I'll park the car and I'll talk to you later. Alright, bye.